So fiction is supposed to offer some measure of hope and comfort to readers. But how do you write hopeful stories about climate change and the imminent death of the planet? So climate change fiction or cli-fi refers to fiction that projects how climate patterns and severe changes in climate patterns affects our lives now and will do so in the future. So all the stories and novels and genres, uh, all the stories and novels in this genre can be set in real worlds or in imaginary worlds. But the narrative will always focus on how we manage to live in environments with severely altered climates. So climate change is clearly the most pressing issue of our time, but the climate change genre, the climate fiction genre is not new. In fact, it's very, very old, I've discovered. So one of the earliest examples of this genre is the French writer Yul Verne's Sa Dissou Dissou, which is uh, in translated in English, it's called Topsy Turvy, which was written in 1889. So in this story, a bunny in the Arctic Circle decides to melt and people go there. And uh, people go there to mine for coal in the Arctic and then there's a complete disaster because we have interfered with the seasons. So this was written in 1889. So since decades, scientists have been studying climate change and writers have been writing about it. Some recent examples would be Margaret Atwood's Mad Adam trilogy, which has three novels of novellas in it. Then there is the novels of J.G. Ballard, The Wind from Nowhere, The Drowned World, The Burning World. This was all written in the 1960s. Then there is British writer Ian McEwan's Solar, which was written in 2010. Barbara King Solver's Flight Behavior, again 2010. So there's a whole lot of fiction out there, and particularly I want to talk about short stories. But before that, I want to talk about Indian writers who haven't really been writing a lot about climate change. In fact, the senior generation, the, you know, the earlier generation has always written about nature and climate change and how it's a wrong idea to mess with climate change. For instance, uh, Tagore has written two plays, Rakta Karabi and Mukta Dhara, which are the sort of, which warn us about how nature is not a quiet onlooker and one day it will respond to us and it won't be a prick, it will be a compelling torrent and humans should be cautious about this. Then there is Anita Desai's Fire on the Mountain which is about humans destroyed nature in their thoughtless pursuit of development. Kamala Markandeya's Nectar in a Sieve which again talks about nature as a destroyer and preserver of life. Then there is Ruskin Bond, who has written a lot about nature and humans. No Room for a Leopard, The Tree Lover, The Cherry Tree, All Creatures Great and Small, various other writings of which, which show the ties between man and nature and how we are destroying these ties and destroying the balance of the ecosystem. Then of course there is Amita, of course, who has, who has been writing a lot about climate change, who has been warning us who has written non-fiction and fiction. For example, his novel, The Hungry Tide, which is set in the Sundarbans and which has been read by many people. In fact, he is the one Indian voice currently who constantly tells us that we should write more fiction and more non-fiction about climate change. But I don't see too many Indian writers in my generation, contemporary Indian writers writing, uh, especially short fiction. Whereas in the West, there is a lot of fiction and non-fiction being written about climate change. I think we should talk about this at a different time, but it is an issue. Why aren't Indian writers more obsessed with climate change? So at the level of ideas, scientists and activists have been talking to us about climate change and its effect for many, many years now. So we've got all the information actually, we've got graphs and statistics and numbers but a lot of people still find it very difficult to understand the impact of climate change on individual lives and the lives of our families and friends. It's just too abstract for us to be tangible. 
we still have that problem and so this crisis demands a form of literary expression that will move it out of the sphere of intellectual knowledge and lodge it deep in our blood streams basically we need to feel it viscerally we need to feel that urgency and i think that is where fiction writers come in so writers are using the tool of short fiction and creating stories that will make us understand how completely dependent we are on climatic stability and because art and fiction sort of gets at the gut we will be able to understand at the gut level what kind of threat we are facing it's not you know numbers don't have that effect on us but that emotional response that it will be able to shape an emotional response to climate change and hopefully that will make us act with enough commitment to deal with our current situation which is not a promising one so one of the things that climate uh, stories about climate change do is to personalize the issue by creating a link between personal traumas and climate traumas and this helps people to confront the unthinkable which is the death of the planet and the real possibility of mass extinction stories remind us of our profound connection to the natural world they bring disaster to life but also tell us that we must celebrate the natural world and its incredible beauty which we may lose for good stories aspire us to wake up and change our course and do our bit to delay or even stop impending doom so one of the challenges of writing about writing climate fiction is that writers have to show readers that their lives are constructed in a way that is causing catastrophic problems for the planet so every time you start your car and go on a long distance trip or you get on a plane or you go to a wedding or you decide to have a child you are actually contributing to climate change so it becomes necessary for us to think about all the carbon that this these normally you know normal happy events will leave behind and we poor writers are left with the really tough job of having to bring up all these uncomfortable truths in our stories and we have to do it without lecturing or without being didactic because once you start giving lectures then fiction will die because fiction is not meant to you know lecture you about all this so it has to be done in a very subtle and convincing way this is a great challenge and the other thing is that traditionally the stake in most short stories is they are based on an individual's fight against a uh, force maybe society like you know a person is rebelling against society or against capitalism or some system in society but the problem with climate change fiction is that climate change is a threat that affects all of us so the stakes in this type of fiction would be people deciding to come together and do what is best for the planet and for everybody to imagine such a story is very tricky and how do you dramatize this in a convincing way because it can fall flat it can become very boring you know a bunch of people just getting together and saving the world so the why where is the drama in that and also who do you expect the reader to root for in such a scenario so th there are very uh, subtle nuances that you have to keep in mind and so what are some of the devices that are that writers are using right now so one very common device and somehow somebody has built one some so this is a very common trope but there are other through our actions we can also use dark humor which is inherent in our difficult time so darkly funny stories push the limits of climate fiction and one story which i really like which is humorous is a story called hermie which is written by nathaniel rich and it's from a collection called i am with the bears stories from a damaged planet it was published in 2011 so this is sort of like a magical realist story 
there is a scientist who is going to a conference and he is about to give a talk there but before that he is in his hotel room and he goes to the bathroom and there he meets a crab a hermit crab who is called hermy and this is a familiar fellow this crab is a familiar character because when the scientist was a little boy he used to go to the beach and he used to meet a crab called who he had named hermy so now hermy has come back to haunt us in the bathroom and hermy starts talking so basically it starts off in a very realistic way where he remembers his childhood where he remembers how he played on the beach etc and then it becomes a magical realist story because the crab is now talking and the crab is talking about how that beach has been destroyed and how all the sea life has been devastated about rising sea levels poisoned water uh, hurricanes and loss of species but it also feels very real because it's so personalized so it's a, about the scientist childhood it is about a landscape that he used to love and then there is the talking crab and there are like instances of humor in it which will really make you smile even though it's a very dark you know view of what has happened so i feel like humor can be used to talk about this very serious subject and also it sort of gives up and gives us an empty point to talk further about global warming and the impacts of environmental degradation so this is another thing that is very common in climate fiction stories is that they deeply rooted in a sense of place in hermy it's a beach in other stories it could be a, you know a piece of uh, grassland where somebody used to walk every day so there is a very um, strong sense of place and the place could be a real one and it could be an imaginary one and it could also have interactions with the place and with the wildlife the animals or trees and then we start off in a realistic way we project into the future we could start off in a very you know um, factual way and then branch off into surrealism or magical realism which a lot of writers have recently used and whether it is realistic or whether it is surreal whether it is intense and dark and funny or whether it's dystopian or satirical stories about climate change always deal with a shared set of challenges which is how to handle the bigness of this thing it is so big that we need to understand it the unknowability of all the changes that are coming our way there is a certain surreal quality to this you know you wake up in the morning and one day there is snow in summer it's quite surreal what is happening and then also about how the author and the reader could find a path between hope and hopelessness because we can't be so hopeless that we just stop writing or we stop thinking so these stories have to show us a sort a, 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 some sort of way between hope and hopelessness uh, another very interesting thing about climate change fiction is that we can speculate because nobody really knows for sure so it gives us a lot of ground for speculation like we can ask all these what if questions which is good for fiction writers so you, you can say you know what if this happens and what would the billionaires do so all the, i'm sure all the billionaires would start a colony in space like you know elon musk would head off to space and take all his rich friends with him maybe they'd build a gated community there like gurgaon in mars who knows and uh, what would the younger generation do like would they get so angry with our with us for creating this mess would they revolt like would we have like a lord of the flies kind of scenario you know where they turn on us saying that this is all your fault you created this for us or what if we started uh, believing in reincarnation would we treat the planet different differently then so we can imagine stories where people think that okay since i'll be born again i have to behave decently i have to save the planet because i'll be coming back to this planet so that is an interesting way of thinking about uh, you know speculation It gives us a lot of fiction and whatever we do these stories are made obviously meant to compel us to feel to find some sort of emotional response to the 
crisis. I don't mean, you know, we burst into tears. What I mean is like, feel it at a gut level, feel it at a visceral level and then do something about it. And uh, also it will teach us to empathize with new generations who we are cursing with our inaction and our thoughtlessness. So that is another function of climate change uh, fiction. So I'd like to cite some very interesting examples of short story collections that focus on climate change. These are recent uh, collections. So there is one called Warmer, which was published in 2018 and was published by Amazon itself, which is contributing in a big way to climate change, ironically. So this is a compilation of seven short stories. And it's called uh, work from very well-known writers and uh, somewhat unknown writers. So there is the Pulitzer Prize winner, Jane Smiley. There is uh, Lauren Groff, who was nominated for the National Book Award. There is Jess Walter, who is also a nominee. And the, all the stories in this collection give us different ways of th thinking about something we desperately do not want to think about, which is the death of the planet. So. The first story, The Way the World Ends, which is by Jess Walter. In that, there is, a, again, the uh, main character is a scientist, hydrogeologist. She's in her late 30s, and she's thinking about freezing her eggs so she can have a child at some point of time in the future. And then she starts thinking about the absurdity of it because she thinks that you know, scientists believe the world to be on the verge of irreversible collapse. So what kind of world am I going to bring this child into? And it sort of branches off from there. Then there is another story in which a mother sort of berates herself for having a daughter. She says this was a terrible mistake she had made out of loneliness. The sheer selfish stupidity of bringing a child into the beginning of the end of the world as humans know it. So basically all the stories have this sense of despair and frustration and also some sort of anguished appreciation for the beauty of life as we know it now because this could end anytime soon. So it sort of seesaws between these two. There is despair and there's also this incredible appreciation for everything that we have around us right now. And there is always the tension between should we give up on this beauty? Like should we, you know, should we marry? Should we have children? Should we do all of that in a hurry? Or should we just give up and say that this is all going to end? So what is the point anyway? You know, should we eat? Should we travel? Should we not do any of these things? Or should we do it all in the time that we have left? Which is an interesting conflict. So all the stories try to capture that. And there are some stories which also present a very disturbing picture of where the earth will end up if we do not act faster and if we do not commit ourselves to. So there is that as well. And all of them invite us to consider the natural environment in the long view and think about our behavior and how our values need to change from a climate change perspective. Because scientists have told us all of this, and I think scientists are a little bit tired now of warning us, you know. So I think it's up to fiction writers to step up and say that, look, cynicism is not going to help. We have to do something. We have to wake up. We have to feel that this is an emotional issue, and, and we have created this issue. So how do we move forward from here? There's another very sweet story that I read, which is very frightening actually, but it's also very sweet. It's called uh, How Close to the Savage Soul. It's from a collection of stories called um, Winds of Change, which was published in 2015. So this particular story is about a young father who imagines his future, how when he becomes a grandfather, and he dreams about taking his grandchild to the beach. But the problem is that the world has changed so much that a simple trip to the beach is no longer possible because the waters have risen, the tide has become acidic, the, the, boys, the water is poisoned now. Increasing temperature makes it impossible for the grandfather to step out of his house with his young uh, grandson. 
and everywhere the teenagers have revolted so we have like a lot of the fly situation because they are very angry with the world you know with the older generation and there is some sort of like armed revolt so basically the world has gone to hell but it's a dream and then he wakes up from it it is beautifully written and that bond between the grandfather and the grandchild sort of you know pulls you into the story so that is another very interesting collection that i uh, want to point you towards and i'd like to read out a story a very short story it's almost like a flash fiction by margaret atwood and this is like one of those defining stories about climate change and it presents a um, future picture of where the planet might be if climate change is not addressed by all of us okay so the story is called time capsule found on the dead planet and in the first age we created gods we carved them out of wood there was still such a thing as wood then we forged them from shining metals and painted them on temple walls there were gods of many kinds and goddesses as well sometimes they were cruel and drank our blood but also they gave us rain and sunshine wind good harvests fertile animals many children a million birds flew over us then a million fish swam in our seas our gods had horns on their heads or moons or the beaks of eagles we called them all knowing we called them shining one we knew we were not orphans we smelled the earth and rolled in it its juices ran down our chins two in the second age we created money this money was also made of shining metal it had two faces on one side was a severed head that of a king or some noteworthy person on the other side was something else something that would give us comfort a bird a fish a far bearing animal this was all that remained of our former gods the money was small in size and each of us would carry some of it with him every day as close to the skin as possible we could not eat this money but as if by magic it could be changed into such things the money was mysterious and we were in awe of it if you had enough of it it was said you would be able to fly 3 in the third age money became a god it was all powerful and out of control it began to talk it began to create on its own it created feasts and famines songs of joy lamentations it created greed and hunger towers of glass rose at its name were destroyed and rose again it began to eat things it ate forests croplands and the lives of children it ate armies ships and cities no one could stop it to have it was a sign of grace for in the fourth age we created deserts our deserts were of several kinds but they had one thing in common nothing grew there some were made of cement some were made of various poisons some of baked earth we made these deserts from the desire for more money wars plagues and famine visited us but we did not stop at last all wells were poisoned all rivers ran with filth all seas were dead there was no land left to grow food some of our wise men turned to the contemplation of deserts a stone in the sand in the setting sun could be very beautiful they said deserts were tidy because there were no weeds in them nothing that crawled stay in the desert long enough and you could apprehend the absolute the number 0 was holy 5 you who have come here from some distant world to this dry lake shore and this kern and to this cylinder of brass in which on the last day of all our recorded days i place our final words pray for us who once thought we could fly